My background is I started at the bottom, worked my way up, worked in the film and TV industry for many, many years, too many to mention. Uh, I've had lots of highs and lows on my journey, which, and depending on the questions you ask, you might go through them, um, which okay. has led to right now where I've created a marketing-based or, or storytelling-based marketing platform specifically for coaches, small businesses, solo business owners, service providers, so they can actually use storytelling in their marketing and sales to attract their ideal audience. I've seen so many people talk about storytelling, but no one was giving people the tools where they could do it themselves. So right. that's the aim of Audience Magnet. The aim of Audience Magnet is to make you an audience magnet for your ideal audience. Cool. And here at the Christian Buddy Show, we like to break the ice early on. So if you don't mind, I've got a few. We do this segment called uh, Rapid Fire Questions. Okay, so, great. I'm ready for them. Ready? Let's go. So I'm do ready. You, Far away. Do you believe in aliens? Oh, interesting. Um, I believe there's other life forms on this planet. Is the globe flat or round? Oh, great question. Um. I feel it's round, but who knows? People who are flat believers will do everything to persuade me that I'm wrong. Coffee or tea or neither? Oh, great question. Coffee, one coffee a day and then herbal tea. iPhone or Android or neither? <laughs> no contest, iPhone. iPhone? All right, last question is just a bit of a, um, a riddle almost, but... Um... If you built a time machine and you traveled into the past to meet your father before he get before you were born, mm -hmm. and let's say you accidentally killed him, uh, would you? Oh. Yeah, I know it's a bit intense, but um, <laughs> would would you still be alive today, or um, or not? So it's kind of like a time travel question, I guess. What if I uh, went back in time and killed my dad? Would, would I be you, around today? Yes. Do you think do you think you would like um like back to the future like they fade away um, um so well, I'm... the the incarnation of who I am and my experiences would not be the same just like if I was born a day earlier or a day later it would not be the same um we can have the experiences of we decide to walk instead of taking the bus or driving and we have a different experience so no I would not be who I am today all right. Thank you very much. That was the rapid fire segment. So now, uh, look, I'm happy to, I'd love to unpack, um, yeah, your experience as a storyteller. So um, I guess my first question would be, uh, why is it so important to find your audience? Uh, that's a great question. When we talk about audience it's really who are the people who kind of resonate and relate to what we have to say and i like to call it your ideal audience because there's many audiences out there but it's about who is your ideal audience and i think there's many different layers to audience there's the audience who's just might be passing by and likes it all the way to the raving fan so if we just use the tv scenario We've got Game of Thrones, for example. We got people who like it, people who say they like it but have never watched it, people who really enjoy it, and then you got those people who are gonna dress up, you know. So it's like these are different stages of audiences and fandom, as it were. Okay. And kind of dipping into storytelling. So why is storytelling so powerful? Well, I, I think stories is a way of communicating. Okay. Lots of people talk about storytelling as in isolation, but it's how we communicate. We use stories daily when we communicate, when we speak to people. Yeah. And, but we don't see it as stories. Uh, this kind of, when you hear this tagline stories, you start thinking of the TV program, the film, or this big thing. And I like to call it as it's a language that we already know. We just don't know the words. You know, we don't know the details of it. So a, a great example is, you know, you're speaking English and someone who speaks a second language, you say a word, and they say, what does that mean? 
And you're like, I don't, I don't really know actually. And then you look it up and you've used it in the correct context and in the right way because you know that language, but you didn't know the details. So storytelling is a bit like that. Everyone understands it, but by understanding it on a deeper level, you're then able to use storytelling on purpose. Right, on purpose. Okay. So, okay. So when you mean on purpose, so I guess kind of unpacking further into that, how how uh, how would you what's the practical way that we can we can use storytelling uh with purpose well i'm specifically talking about business storytelling and using storytelling in your business to attract your ideal audience so i just yeah. want to make that very clear and okay i think the i think the kind of um mistake people make is they think i just need to tell stories to attract my ideal audience what I mean by on purpose, we're purposely constructing and telling stories in order for our potential ideal audience to go, aha, and be attracted to it. But ultimately, it's leading them on a journey because, for want of a better word, you have something that you think's of value. Yeah. And you want them to see that, yes, it is the value or the way that they can solve the issue or problem they've got. You are the solution. Okay. Why do you think people are attracted to stories? It's part of our DNA. I mean, we, we, we create stories in our head. If you think about just ourselves, we're always telling ourselves stories. Everything we do, oh, I should be doing this, or why am I doing that? We have stories around them. Some are positive, some are not so positive. Some bring us down. And if you think about it, the if you think about a story that isn't a, necessarily a positive story, that can bring someone in a spiral as they go round mm. and round in their own head telling the story. To someone else, it seems ridiculous, but it's been built up into something that is bigger than it potentially is. So I mm. think stories, I, I keep, I like to emphasize it's a way of communicating. We understand that. And the purpose about it is once you understand it, okay, how can I communicate with an intention? And the intention is first and foremost to, if I, if, if I have something of value to offer is to get myself out there. So those who are attracted, not to just what I say, how I say it, how I articulate it, my unique way of communicating, my quirks, all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. They go, yeah. yeah, you know what? I feel that person. So the key about storytelling, it's not about pretending to be something, yet it is about understanding that construction and having a purpose around it, that's more likely to attract people. If we flip that and we kind of start looking at TV shows and films, they're created on purpose. They have a structure. There's a journey they're taking the audience through you know, we're using sound as well to heighten people's emotions, but there's an intention about that story. We've also heard the stories that ramble on and you're like, okay, so what's your point? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so true, yeah. And it's kind of reminds me of this point that I, I heard this somewhere where someone was saying um, it's very difficult to be interesting and correct at the same time because yeah I, I know that like that rambling on uh, shout out to my dad I, lo I love my dad but you know sometimes he can ramble on before he gets to the point but um i i mean you know I, it, what's your point you know wh what are you trying to tell me you know I, I you know that's that's um yeah because our, our attention i feel like society in these days with the digital age our attention span is is getting shorter and shorter and I guess my next question is how do you capture people's attention? Because it's it's so difficult to capture people's attention these days. Um, yeah, I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. It's challenging to capture people's attention because I think attention and time are the most valuable elements. And we're competing for someone's attention and time against everything so mm. they're the challenges already 
Um, in terms of people don't have time or want things short, I, I disagree with that. I think it all depends on the context. Um, yes, the right, certain context, 20 seconds is too long. But other contexts, an hour is not enough. So I think it's all about the context. And um, use um, podcasting, for example. Um, I listen to podcasts. I've been listening to podcasts since 2005. So when you had to listen to it on your computer, there wasn't even an iPhone at the time. And still, yeah. I listen to two hours of podcasting a day. Yet to decide to sit down and watch something, that's a bigger ask. Yeah, definitely that context is is definitely something that I'm going to write in my notes because, uh, yeah, that's that's so powerful. Uh, and it's so so true because, like, I've watched the Joe Rogan interview with someone I like and, I, and I'll watch the whole thing. But then, yeah, it's, it's so true what you're saying. So I guess I, I want to – so you've got some experience working for large companies and – I'm curious to hear your journey, how you got into this this avenue that you're into now. Okay. What was the journey? So the, the journey started um, when I was 18 and I got a job as an extra. And I thought, hey, nice cushy job, extra. They give you food and then you get paid at the end of the day. And the first day turned up, nothing was done. They sent us home, great. And then the next day, I suddenly saw all this film equipment and all these kind of um, trucks and lights. And I was like, what's that? Um, from my point of view, I turned the TV on and then you watch something. I didn't think about how it was made. So suddenly I went, I want to do that. That's exactly what I want to do. And then I spent, I'd say about nine months pounding the concrete, as I like to say, in Soho, London, looking for a gig, looking for a job, just as a runner, starting at the bottom. Um, yeah. After nine months, yes, I got the opportunity and that started the journey. So I started at the bottom, worked my way up, um, started as a runner. You know, I've been a camera assistant. I kind of worked for Chris Evans in the UK before he was the big name that he was. And wow. kind of then decided after working for a, a, a couple of years that I want to learn a bit more. Um, so that's when I decided to study film. Um, and I went on to study film. I'm probably the last generation that learned to edit on a Steambeck. And a Steambeck, um, I'd say it's the first non-linear editor. So imagine a flat table with these big cogs and you'd shoot film. I was doing 16, Super 16. You get the, the, the film back. So 400 feet, which is about that big, that is 10 minutes of film. 35 mil, 1,000 feet, 10 minutes of film. So that is about that big. You put it on the steam back. You'll have the sound separately. And I was fortunate enough to be taught by a guy called Terry who'd been um, editing documentaries for the BBC. So I was kind of taught by a pro on how to use it. And then, like anything, you leave, you stop studying. You're out in a big, bad world. And you realise you're really good at what you spent your time learning and doing but no one's taught you how to get work and there was mm. that big kind of gap of yes i'm really skillful at this but how do i package myself how do i communicate to be seen and get the work and i think that's an issue with a lot of places where people are studying you know they're learning that skill but really the skill is how can i use that of benefit for someone else um, okay. I'm going to cut my story short because I could spend a whole whole uh, <laughs> stream talking about that. What, what, but, uh, so, uh, what was that thing that you mentioned, the stream deck? What was that? It's called Steenbeck. S-T-E-E-N Beck. So it's one of the first, it's a flat, flat bed editor. So it's, you know, you had a table, you had a small screen. There's a video on YouTube called, I think it's editing 16 mil Steenbeck. And it shows you how to do an edit on it. So when it, I like showing that when I'm teaching, um, when I'm teaching students that one of the first things I like to show them, so they don't complain if you think it's challenging and on a computer, it's easy. When I say easy, the tools are easy. However, editing is about having the skill and the heart. 
to be able so, to co connect content together because really editing is about storytelling and engaging the audience on an emotional level that's it yeah that's the thing that's back. it yep wow so you that see is the back one the back one there in your image there that would have been the film the two two front ones that would have been the sound that'd be mag stock and the sound would have gone through that you'd lace it through that small screen there that's probably the size of a i don't know a 10 inch tablet really low quality and then from the um developers you shoot your film they give you it's called light rushes print which was a cheaper version you'll use that um you'd once you'd edit it all you'd have to write the edge numbers down send that back to the lab and they'll do a, a final print for the film wow so yeah sorry sorry what are you saying no no after you uh, uh so my understanding is that this is a, a physical so you're literally you're cutting the film is that is that what you're doing or that's yeah, yeah. that's why it's called cutting you know you cutting actually yeah you yep. you'll, you'll pull it out it's splicer you'll splice the film you'll go to a film bin and a bin's when you stored it and it's made of fabric so the film didn't scratch they're on hooks you'll go you'll look in the light and you'll see okay yeah this is the right one you'll then get them together you'll put tape in between them to join them together and then you'll have a look wow. at your edit to see if it was right or not so it's very physical um very time consuming what if i want special effects well that was a different back then that was uh and again i didn't myself do special effects but that would have gone to a different department where they would have scanned uh... it done the effects and stuff like that so it was a very kind of uh physical time consuming um uh, thing however the physicality of it was really enjoyable yeah it's it's like your craft it's you're you're going back to that that the the crafting of 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 a product and yeah i think there's something beautiful in that and now through the through the digital age everything's been uh it's, everything's on software now it's it's all it's yeah. all virtue yeah it's there's no personal touch now these days it's it's uh well, well, I, I i think it's different i like to say it's, it's different. different yeah it's diff yeah, yeah, different yeah different so yeah. so i i wouldn't say that it's, things evolve thing, things change um if you think about it you'd make an edit and if it didn't work you had to go back untape it chop it again and the more you chopped an edit it just shaved a little bit more for film so you'll get points where there'd be holes you have to put lots of tape on it just so it'll hold it together it's it's much better nowadays um and I, I however i think what it made the thing i found um especially when i'm kind of training the new generation of filmmakers is not just film but even when you had to do um, linear tape to tape you had to think about and plan what you were going to do before you couldn't just make changes just like that so I think the skill you learned was kind of thinking and planning a bit more. And I think I find now because you can just chop and change. Some people find it hard to do a specific thing before moving on. They like chopping around and changing and doing all these things. Um, whereas it's about, no, let's work on a specific thing. Let's hone that. Then let's move on to the next bit, et cetera, if that makes sense. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, it does make sense. And I'm currently shooting. I'm currently making a YouTube video on my um, on my running experience, uh, and yeah, um, it's it's probably my biggest video in terms of I'm putting a lot of time into it, and yeah, I'm, I'm I want to complete one thing and then move to the next thing, and you have to have that. You have to plan ahead, even with your shots. You you know, you, things have to be centered. Um, it has to make sense in the storyline, uh, and. I feel like I don't know how fast my cuts need to be because I'm trying to I want them to be people I want to grab people's attention. So um yeah. Do, do you know and the thing is uh, I haven't got an answer for you. But sometimes speed isn't the only way. Um people do confuse fast cutting with holding people's attention. And it's all, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. It's about context. It's all about the context. Um, there's certain things that add when they're fast, but there's certain things that add when we build up to it. So yeah. and if, you, if you just watch any drama, they have fast bits, they have slow bits, because as humans, we don't, we like surprise. 
we 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 like to know what we're going to get, but we lo- also like surprises. We're kind of a dichotomy. We like both of these things. So it's always yeah. trying to balance this in the right place. If we had something that's just fast, 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 we know what it is. But you know, like an action thing, you don't have to think. It's not challenging in any way that way. Then you have other films that are much slower. And for some mm. people, they're like, oh, that's great. I had to really think about. It. And other people are like, I haven't got time for that. So I think it's about the context what you're trying to say, what you're trying to achieve. You know, you could, for example, I I don't know what you're doing. You could do one that's um, about the running and on your running, it could be, hey, I get ready. I take my time getting ready. And then when I run, I run really fast and you make it really fast. And then you wind down. You could use that feel to it. You know, you could decide to do a piece. You know what? I'm actually going to do it that although I'm running fast, I'm going to make this feel slower. I want the audience to really feel the pain that I'm going through, how I'm pushing myself. Can you see already they're two different things? The same footage. One is showing, yes, I go fast. The other was like, I'm showing you the challenge that I go through and how I push myself, how I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. So there's not one right way. And I think that's the beautiful thing about the medium. There isn't a right way. I I like to say um, there are many choices. Some are better than others yeah yeah what's your favorite movie oh people ask that you know what yeah. i'm not a favorites kind of person i okay. like lots of things with different things if you and i i actually uh, i'd say i'm prefer i'm more of a episodic tv person right. than movies um i find that you know i enjoy them both i find them quite different so if you think about it in the context i'm speaking a film, a movie's two, well, 90 to ninety minutes to two hours. We can only get a snapshot of the person. So invariably, mm. movies are about, here's a situation that happened. This is the dilemma they're through. How do they deal with it? And how this is how it's resolved or not resolved. Whereas I find episodic is about the human spirit, the, the kind of contradictory nature of us as beings us being in situations as we get to know someone more and more and i really like that kind of thing you know you know sometimes you're watching something you go oh my gosh do you see what happened yeah because in episode four so and so happened this is like (laughs) us knowing someone a film Mm. can't achieve that so i think they're they're different mediums just like shorts are a different medium so i appreciate them for their different mediums but in terms of the human experience i do enjoy it a good episodic good, ep- good episodic yeah yeah definitely you you, you build that relationship uh, relation with the character and mm. yeah it's it's uh it's nice in in that in that regard mm. yeah and i just happened to browse your 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 uh, your footprint online and you're speaking of really? embarrass yeah <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you're speaking about embarrassing yourself in public, okay? <laughs> which uh, which I found quite quite good because I'd like you to, if you don't mind sharing, what what made you put that up there, and what was your experience like in that moment? Okay, so why did I put it up there? Um, I just want people to experience who I am. Okay, and it comes back to the what I said earlier. It's like, hey. Let me be my unique self, quirks and all, and the right people will gravitate or not. However, I don't have to second guess myself. I don't have to remember what I did previously because when you're just being who you are, you can just be it. And contradictory with that. We're all contradictory. I'm So yeah. I'm happy to do that. So I'll tell you, okay, I'll tell you the, the context you're talking about, the story you're telling. So um, I... Many years ago, I created an online platform for short filmmakers. And this was pre-iPhone. So it was a crazy idea I had about 20 years ago. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if people like me could um, build an audience and get their work seen by people? It was just this crazy idea. We make stuff. We want people to see it. I mean, nothing's changed. It's the same today. So I just had this crazy idea. And then it came to the point where technology was changing. This is when kind of YouTube was kind of really becoming really big before um, they were bought by Google, actually around the same time. 
And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to get a grant from the Department of Trade and Industry to kind of research it more. And on that journey, uh, I did, I got invited to do a Dragon's Den style pitch. So imagine <laughs> there's seven people, was there seven? Seven of us. Yeah. Some swanky place in London, an audience yeah. of a hundred people. And, you know, there's people there that I've raised 5 million. I've raised 10 million. We've only raised 250,000. And there was little me with my own business, currently using my own money for it. And I was there. And I was right at the end. And they said, and we would like to welcome Dennis, who's got this innovative new platform for independent short filmmakers and mobile video. So I went on stage right at the end. And then I looked in front and I saw the audience. And then my, my head just went like jelly. I just was like, I, I couldn't think. It was just like wobbling around. And I was like, oh my God, this is the most embarrassing. You're, you're going to embarrass yourself. The longer I left it, as the pin dropped, people were waiting in anticipation. So I built this thing up where I was like, this is so embarrassing. So we allowed five slides. So the situation was, it was a Dragon's Den style pitch. I think we, I can't remember exactly. We had two or three or five minutes, maybe three minutes to to say what we were doing and we allowed five slides. So I was like, Dennis, come on, get yourself together, get yourself together. So I thought, okay, I've got five slides. Let me turn around and see where I am. So I turned around to look at the slides and it was on slide five instead of slide one. And that took me out of my fogginess. I went, hey, it's wrong. And the minute I did this, I came out of this kind of fog. I did, I did my, I told, told my story about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I actually won that day, that pitch that day, won a thousand quid cash, which was great. I used to buy a laptop. <laughs> and what was interesting though, I didn't know what I did. Um, I did. And seven years later, I was, I had people coming up to me who do all this all the time saying, listen, I've seen so many pictures in my life and it was the best thing I've ever seen. I still don't know what I did, but to get that was just really kind of good. And I think it ties into what do people buy into? It's like when you're being yourself, you're passionate about something. It it, it means something to you. It's coming from in here. We can feel yeah. that. We can see that. And when we have that, we're like, okay, you know, we, we want to get on board with you. And I, that's what I'm kind of encouraging all people to do. Don't try to be a cookie cutter. Just be who you are so the right people say, yep, I connect with you. That's yeah. my embarrassing story. It flipped round in the end. Well, that's the embarrassing story you're talking about. There's many times I embarrass <laughs> you. Non-stop. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks for sharing that. That was a, that was a good story. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. All right. Well, um, okay. Um, I'm kind of running out of questions to ask now uh okay. <laughs> yeah to be honest um but i'm enjoying uh yeah learning from you at the moment and i guess where does what's your vision what's your what's wh where do you see yourself i know this the whole cliche question but i want to just what what is your vision or put it at that what is your vision it's pretty good i don't think it's 2020 at the moment no joking <laughs> 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 um so well, my vision is I've created um, a storytelling-based marketing platform, which is, um, as I said, targeting coaches, independent business owners, service providers. And my vision is seeing more people using storytelling and growing their business, using it in their marketing and sales, growing their business so they can start, you know, continue or start to live the life and lifestyle that they desire. Um, because they're communicating in a way. And I think the thing about storytelling is a constant way of communicating. I think one of the things that it's a little bugbear is when people do talk about stories, it, they, they make it feel like, hey, have a story, one story, and just tell that again and again. I disagree. It's about we are constantly telling different stories. People are at different stages with us. Yep. So yeah. we need to be telling different stories at different times. We need to be telling the same story structured differently and using different elements in them. So it's a, not a one and done. It's a constantly evolving thing. 
And I, I just want more people to kind of feel they have the freedom that they desire in life. That's freedom of time, freedom to do what they want. And I honestly feel that by becoming a better communicator um, and using storytelling in your communication, that could be a real stepping stone in that direction if you take action and take it seriously. And what do you think are good traits of a communicator, an authentic communicator? Oh, what do I think is a good trait? You know what? Being comfortable being yourself, yet getting better at articulating how you communicate. I think they're the traits. Um, it's kind of, if you're an extrovert, that's great. If you're an introvert, that's great. Don't try and be something you're not. Yeah. Get comfortable embracing who you are and then bringing the best of that to the fore. And, and I, I think so, I, so I'd say everyone has the capacity, but with anything, the more you do something, the better you get. And I've been doing storytelling, well, all of my adult life, most of my life. And I'm always learning every day. I can learn off anyone. I could learn off, you know, just from someone in the street that I might meet at a bus stop, you know, a three-year-old child, how they respond and how they communicate. It's like being aware, learning from others. And yes, I've got a lot that I can guide and teach people. I, I'd like to say I, I'm a great guide. I'm able to guide people so they can have the skill and find the journey themselves. But like any great guide, I feel, you're constantly growing and learning. You're tripping up, you're making mistakes. You're like, mm, I need to change that. That wasn't great. And you just get better and better and better at it. And I, I suppose the better you get at it, the less concerned you are of making a mistake. It's like what you said earlier, you know, we do loads of things. Oh, we might make a mistake here, might stay. But if we do lots of it, it's just, mm, it's, it's just, yeah. a, it's not a mistake. It's a, a learning process or a stepping stone to understanding and getting better at something. Yeah, that's, that's so true. It's so powerful. Uh, um, okay. And you have a, a gift for the people listening at home. Um, I just thought I'd just quickly share my screen. Uh, make sure you uh, send them your actual link because if you're on your screen it's slightly different link but yes i've created um a gift for you all um, i really appreciate your time listening and if, if you think that storytelling can help you um i'm offering i'm giving you um the four types of storytelling with 60 ways to engage your ideal audience so whatever um type or form of communicator you are there'll be something there and some ideas to kind of spark the, the juice of, of creativity in you so you can start using storytelling and communicating to your ideal audience. Again, I'm called Audience Magnet for a reason because I want you to become an audience magnet. Awesome. And the, the, the best way to reach you is through audiencemagnet.com or what's, yeah. what, what's yep. That's so the, the best, best way. way is, um, is firstly go to this page, which is the audience magnet.com forward slash Christian. If you want to go to um, get the free gift and then you can contact me through there or you can go to audience magnet.com. So awesome. either way. Um, and if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, feel free to connect with me there as well. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, we might, I might end the podcast there, Dennis. It's been um, a pleasure speaking with you and about, likewise. yeah, about storytelling. I've learned a few things definitely. And uh, thanks for,